G'day folks, my name is Rob. Welcome back to another F1 Fantasy video. Today we are looking at my preview and final thoughts for Race Week 13 ahead of the Belgian Grand Prix this coming weekend. As always, if you're enjoying the content and you're new around here, please do like the video and subscribe to the channel. I just hit that 1K, very small subscriber milestone. So very happy with all that and how things have gone so far. So thank you to you guys that have made this possible, got me to this point. I'm really excited for what the rest of the season and beyond holds. So stay tuned because there's plenty more exciting things to come for this channel uh, now and in the future. This video is going to be broken up into two parts. The first, I'm going to kind of look at the dilemmas, questions and other considerations that need to be made ahead of the weekend. And then the second part will obviously be revisiting my team. I put out a team selection video earlier in the week. The template is wide open. Obviously, Red Bull and McLaren are featuring heavily. But I think because of so many budgetary constraints, people who were piling in on certain assets earlier than others, there's really so much at stake. Uh, and in a race where there's not only weather factors to consider, but also the fact that the sprint race and ship usage is forefront of our thinking. I think there's a lot of potential for rank swings, points hauls, you name it. And if things go well, then amazing. If things go bad, you've got four weeks to stew on all the decisions you wish you'd made. But let's get uh, straight into the content. First of all, chip usage. I think a number of chips obviously come to mind. The, the three most powerful chips in the game, Extra DRS, Boost, Autopilot and Limitless are probably front and center for a lot of us. I used my Extra DRS in Austria. I was very happy with how things went there, but there are still a lot of people that have got that up their sleeve. I think it's certainly an option to use at Spa, very formidable and obviously I think one of, if not the most powerful chips in the game. Max is still front and center ahead of everyone else on the grid and remains the most likely race winner. So I think if you feel inclined, you have a good feeling about where he's at, the form he's in at the moment, then definitely go for it. Uh, Perez, I think, is still the number two driver on the grid despite some of his recent form woes of late, but turned it around last week in Hungary, and I think that's a good omen heading into Belgium. So if you're confident in Max on a sprint weekend, really delivering the goods, then go for your life. I do think, though, with the weather, it's probably a little risky, and we've got circuits like Qatar, Circuit of the Americas, for instance, in the US, where the weather is typically going to be a little drier. So maybe if you don't want to use it now, consider using it at one of those two circuits. Um, but, you know, if you do, as I mentioned, have a good feeling about Max, given how strong that Red Bull still is and the gap that exists between the rest of the competition, then absolutely go for your life if you feel strongly about it. I think Autopilot, a really good and probably underrated chip this weekend, I think is going to be very effective for those of you that own multiple potential race winners. Verstappen, Perez, Alonso, Norris, all drivers that come to mind for me and all drivers that feature quite heavily in the template. So given that, you know, there is, I mean, obviously Max is the most dominant and the favorite to win, but given that there is a few different options and if weather obviously plays a factor and Max has a stinker, then, you know, there's a number of potential different outcomes. Obviously, Norris has looked really good. Perez has rebounded. Um, and Alonso, if he can rediscover some of that early season form, is also another option. So if you're not sure who's going to score the highest autopilot in a race where weather is obviously a factor, I think this is going to be an extremely valuable chip to consider using. Myself, again, will probably wait until a little later in the season, but I think it's certainly an underrated chip and one that's definitely not quite as sexy as the extra DRS boost or the limitless as for Limitless, I think there have been opportunities where people so far this season have used it to great effect. I have not yet used it and I have every intention of using it later in the season. The reason why is because still a lot of us are tripled up on Red Bull, um, obviously because of how dominant they are. And a lot of people are now moving to a two or a three um, McLaren uh, ownership. So if you were to go for the Limitless chip, I don't think the value that it can obviously provide later in the season where someone like a Mercedes or even a Ferrari, if they come back into our thinking, have much lower ownership bases. They're all very expensive and you can't really afford you know, multiple of that, that in one team, I think is the best time to deploy that chip. Um, so I think as well with the wet weather, there's just more at stake here. Uh, a lot more variables in place. So my, my position on that is better used at a circuit like Qatar where it's going to be dry. Circuit of the Americas, I mentioned. Even Interlagos where Mercedes have quite 
a good record there in recent times. Russell last year, Hamilton, I believe it was the year before. So uh, just keep that in mind. But I think, um, you know, just because of the weather, it shouldn't deter you from wanting to use a chip if you feel strongly about it. As for questions I've received from you guys on Twitter, on YouTube so far this week, Triple McLaren, is it worth it? In a nutshell, yes, absolutely. They are far and away the best value for money uh, asset drivers and constructors over the last three races. Uh, Lando's put in some stellar drives lately, back-to-back -back podiums. Oscar's really kind of come into his own top two top five finishes in the last two weeks. Uh, and then the constructors really hold, you know, because it's the consolidation of both of their scores without obviously driver of the day. Uh, but you got the bonus of pit stops and they've had, I think, 25 points of pit stops in the last three weeks. They had the, the fastest pit stop in Silverstone and in Austria and then the second fastest in Hungary. So that's a, an added bonus if you've got the McLaren constructor and I think should be number one on your shopping list this week if you haven't already got them in your team. I know there's going to be some compromises that need to be made to accommodate three McLaren assets. Perez, uh, I guess, a likely scapegoat for a lot of people, and I'm reluctant at the moment to part ways with him because of his obvious uh, low, sorry, high points floor and high point ceiling because of that Red Bull strength. So I think there's some deliberation that needs to be had as to whether you go your separate ways with Perez, but it's something I'm grappling with at the moment, which segues quite nicely into that next question as to what to do with him. I think, as I mentioned, got a lot of points potential uh, and it is a difficult decision because for me, I don't see him as really a, an asset that I'd want to get rid of anytime soon. I think he's a long-term hold. That Red Bull still looks really good um, and for the reasons mentioned about his qualifying performance, is pretty much a guarantee to get 20 points most weeks. So I think it's going to be hard and I think realistically the compromise is going to need to be made on one of those McLaren drivers or one of those drivers around that kind of like 8 to 11, 12 million, whether it's Alonso or whoever it might be, that's probably where I'm looking to redistribute funds at the moment to get that constructor in. So right now, Perez is no go for me uh, and I would need to like really see some things in the next kind of 48 hours before we get to the deadline to move off him. But there are some really good builds out there that are without Perez and we'll go through them momentarily. Right now though, I'm, I'm still with Checo. As for Ricardo being the best budget option, I definitely think he's a great option to have and is due for a price rise in the coming weeks, if not um, in Belgium. Do I think he's the best budget option in a vacuum. No, I think Joe and Sonoda are more established fantasy options. They're more proven. We know what we're getting from both of them. They're good for about seven to nine, 10 points most race weeks. So I don't necessarily think that should detract from Ricardo's value. At 4.5, I do think he is the best budget driver at that price point. So you've got Sargent and Hulkenberg to contend with. I definitely think fantasy wise, he's the best of those three. But as I mentioned around kind of accommodating these McLaren assets, we are going to have to make compromises elsewhere in our team. I think Ricardo, for people like myself and others that own him, is a logical scapegoat. So to be honest, I'm not quite sure where at the moment he fits into my team because of the fact that my budget is a little lower than where a lot of others are. And that's partly because I only got in a McLaren last week. But to be honest, um, I still think he is a great value driver at four and a half million. He should be closer to five million. And I think that price wise, price rise will come soon, uh, sooner or later. All he needs is one or two solid races with, you know, somewhere between five and 10 points and bang, he'll start going up in price. So to be honest, um, yes, is he, he's a great driver. Is he the best budget driver overall? No, Joe Sonoda, but at that price point, I think so. As far as my team shaping up for this weekend, I do have some reservations about the decisions I made last week in Hungary. Yes, I'm glad I got double McLaren, but it wasn't the two McLaren assets. I should have got them. The constructor, as I mentioned, definitely the best option. And for those that own McLaren constructor, flew up the ranks uh, relatively more than, say, guys that were doubled up on these two, like myself. As far as some team builds to consider a concern, the one I'm looking at first and foremost, and just about all of these builds are going to require a minus four hit for me, so definitely um, just something to keep in mind. I think minus four isn't the be all and end all. It's a very small sacrifice to make for a constructor like McLaren because of the points upside they have. 
But at least as far as my team build's concerned this weekend, as I mentioned, priority number one should be McLaren. So I'm going to get them in. I think as far as um, the, the second driver, Alonso fits the build for me nicely. I know he's not quite at the form, the level he was performing at through the first half dozen or so races, but he is still putting that car in and around the points. I know there's going to be some concerns around whether or not the upgrades that are expected for Aston Martin are going to do the job, but I do think that this circuit um, at Spa hopefully favours them a little more than from what we've seen so far through the first or the last couple of races anyway. So if I do get him into my team t uh, to accommodate McLaren only because he's slightly more economical than Norris, that only gives me 4.2 left doesn't really leave me with any options except for the dreaded Nico Hülkenberg. He scored back-to-back -back zeros, um, which isn't by any means encouraging, but something I'm trying to focus on a little more this week, which probably was to the detriment of my team selection last week, is focus on where you, your team can score points and not worry so much about where your team can't score points. And what I mean by that is, as I mentioned, compromising on assets like Ricardo, where I thought he'd be able to get driver of the day, but didn't, obviously and focus on McLaren Constructor, where they have hit you know, 50, 60 points the last three races. So even if Hülkenberg comes away with another zero, it's probably not the end of the world because a Ricardo and Aston Martin build is probably not going to outscore a McLaren and a Hülkenberg build. So anyway, that's kind of one team I'm weighing up at the moment. The second team I'm looking at is to keep Norris and forego Piastri. So if we were to get cheeky old Lando back in, um, keep the constructor obviously because that's kind of where I'm putting a lot of my eggs this weekend, that would leave 7.4 for me to, to pile into and that is a perfect amount of money for none other than Alex Albon. I think the Williams is going to do particularly well at Belgium, certainly more so than what we saw in Hungary because of those slower speed corners that last week presented. I know Albon had 8 points both in Silverstone and in Hungary. And I don't necessarily think that's um, you know, a bad thing. Uh, I mean, yes, the car drove uh, proportionally worse in Hungary because of those corners. And the Williams is known for its excellent straight line speed, which Belgium has more of. So I think he'll be back in the picture uh, sprint race weekend. So hopefully a few more points for him as well. And then stuck with Hulk. But again, not trying to get too carried away with where points can't be scored and focus on where points can be scored. And I think with these three heavy hitters as my drivers and a driver like Albon, who's known to outperform the car more often than not, I'd feel pretty comfortable and confident about this build as well. The third build, which my friend Adam over at F1 Fantasy HQ filled me in on, I hadn't really considered it because it meant going without Checo, is obviously um, something, again, not I'm super huge on, but is an alternative and avoids the dreaded budget driver conundrum. So, triple and also means you can triple up on McLaren as well. I think it's quite a well balanced team, but this gives me 10.6, and you've got just about any driver um, under Alonso to play with. I don't think it's it's amazing that some of these options, but. You know, the, the Alpines had a little bit of a discount after back to back DNF. Surprised they haven't even gone surprised they haven't gone down more than 0 0.1. But you've got, you know, a bit of optionality around this price point. Bottas obviously did really well in qualifying as well in Hungary. Maybe he can replicate some of that form in Belgium. I'm not so sure. Uh, but I think to be honest, Lance Stroll, I know he's had a few stinkers lately, and I don't think um, yeah, he's anything special, but I do think the Aston Martin of these options, of these cars at this price point, is still the most likely to finish in and around the points. He's known to have some really bad qualifying sessions as well. Unfortunately, hasn't been able to use the car to his advantage to make those overtakes and positions gain, but hopefully on a sprint weekend, as I mentioned about Albon and other drivers, more points on offer, hopefully an opportunity for Lance to, to pick up some points. So I think he fits quite nicely in there. And it gives you a bit more flexibility around moving between different drivers, um, kind of higher and lower. And with two trades in mind or two trades in hand every week, you're certainly able to pivot between different drivers. I don't think I'm so keen on this build only because of the fact that 
Um, I don't have Checo. There are some people that are looking at moving from Checo to Russell to accommodate the three Aston Martin, uh, three McLaren. Sorry, I don't have budget for this unfortunately. But if we did get him back in here, you know, having triple triple Red Bull, triple McLaren, and Hulkenberg, I think is probably the ideal team build for people who can stretch to him. I obviously can't. Otherwise, you could probably get rid of Piastri. Throw in Ricardo, that'd get you six point seven. If you can get to Albon with that team, that's sensational. Sorry, I'm talking about Russell. What what am I going on about? It's been a long day. I think this is also um, a potential build too. If you want to stick with Ricardo over Hulkenberg, I think that's great. Um, again, you know, there's plenty of different options this week, uh, and I know there's. I think with the sprint race, the weather, so many variables. So. Knowing me, I'm probably not going to make the right decision because that's the beauty of fantasy. But at the end of the day, um, you know, that's that's what's really exciting. It's probably the most pivotal race we've had so far this season in terms of sprint, chips, variety of teams. So do stay tuned. I'll be trying to farm out as much content on my Twitter between now and the deadline, which is Friday. So keep that in the back of your minds. Um, and yeah, don't... I think as much as I say, do pay some attention to practice, but don't let it eat you up like it does for me most races with all three sessions. We only have one session before the deadline, and I think being able to make an educated decision on your team before we see the practice results will hopefully mean you're not too influenced by FP1, which is usually the, the practice session that has the most variance in it. So I'm not going to get try and get too carried away by it, but again, and with the weather, it could be really a write-off but that's kind of where my head's at I like this team I like the teams I've showed before I think right now the, the team I'll be running with will be a Checo build with Piastri uh, Hulk and Alonso but again not going to try and let too much influence me there's so much variety as I said so really exciting time for F1 Fantasy as always guys Thanks for dropping by. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do so because it means a great deal to me. Good luck with your teams this weekend and I'll see you all very soon.